like to thank you all for coming out sh and showing support for the organization, and especially for our guest speaker, Mr. Steve Serio. Um, we're going to start off with a short video. The video showcases the Rio 2016 Olympic Games, highlights both men and women's national basketball teams. So we're going to start off with that before we bring up Steve. Their wheelchair basketball action in the Rio Olympic Arena began with a men's group B preliminary round match between the United States and Germany. The team wants to pass up top to Haller, comes right back into v -neck. You can see the attention they're giving Bell. And Sirio, that's a three, and Sirio ties the game up with a three pointer. Dry Mueller, he's come in, nice spin. Long shot, shot clock was expiring, that was good. Scott, Sirio, back to Scott, take the shot, got it to Scott, inside, and Scott, look at how he got up in the chair. Out now, pass one, goes to the basket, good pass by Haluski, and great finish. He was underneath the basket, but he got a no mark on it, just kissed the, kissed the glass, and put it in. With lots of time for a three pointer, and it's good 56 34, and that's what will kill you. Gets past Goose, he's got a path to the basket now, and lays it in 58 36. Okay, correct, plays for Bilbao in Spain. That one goes in at 64 39. A second win for the United States, a second defeat for Germany. In the Carioca Arena 1, a women's group A class saw Great Britain take on Argentina. More underneath the basket, good play from the forward, and six for two as well. The team that are based in centralized training base at the moment. 42-7 Great Britain. Hazelden unopposed, picks up another two, Joy Hazelden. Ryan Waits puts the shot up and two for two. Hamer needs this basket, Jude Hamer for her confidence and gets it. Freeman's not firing, but he can go to Hamer, a player with a lot of experience, lovely one-handed shot. And he's carrying Hamer into the paint, Morrow into the paint, that's better from Great Britain and better from Hamer. Captain of Argentina, Polares, shot up and shot down for her. And when she shoots with a proper technique, i.e. not one-handed, she's got a good shot there, Polares. Can Hamer go to double figures? Yes, she can. A comprehensive win for Great Britain, their first in the competition, a second defeat for Argentina. Okay, so, everyone, we have Mr. Okay. Steve Serio. He's the co-captain of the USA Men's National Wheelchair Olympic team. He also helped lead Team USA to their first Paralympic gold medal since 1988, so it's definitely an honor to have him. Um, everybody, give it up, Steve. Hey, everybody! Thanks for uh, thanks for coming out tonight. I know that there's a lot going on with the uh, Winter Games one, uh, opening ceremonies, Duke UNC, the games tonight. So thank you guys for coming out. Um, before I start, I just want to thank Kanisha, all you guys, educators, leadership here at UConn. You know, there's a lot of moving pieces that go into not only creating this you know, disability awareness theme night, but creating an entirely new adaptive sports program. So thank you for having me, and thank you guys for coming up. Ever since I returned home from competing in the 2016 
Rio Paralympic Games, I've had the opportunity to speak in front of a variety of different people. I've gotten a chance to go back and speak at my old high school. Uh, I make appearances at classes for kids with special needs all over the tri-state area, all the way up to Fortune 500 companies. But I rarely get as excited as I am to just kind of speak in front of you guys here today. And I love the fact that this is an intimate group that we can have just a real back and forth conversation. You know, you guys are creating something from the ground level that I'm truly passionate about. You know, adaptive sports you guys will see throughout the course of tonight is something that has changed my life forever and um, is something that I'm trying to give back to uh, other future athletes. You know, competing in Olympic or Paralympic Games is a dream for any athlete. Um, and to be able to bring home a gold medal from one of them is a literal dream come true. But my journey actually started at the uh, adaptive sports program at the University of Illinois. It's where I learned valuable lessons like hard work, um, working together as a team, and how important uh, it is to have a more in inclusive society and how that impacts everybody. Um, so I encourage you guys to ask as many questions as humanly possible tonight. Um, they can be really thought-provoking, and we can have an actual back and forth, or they could be strange and weird. I've, I've <laughs> literally been asked every single question under the sun. Um, I'm very open about my life. I'm very open about my disability. Um, I'm very open about my experiences. So um, please do not hesitate, and hopefully we can kind of leave tonight a little bit more informed, and then we can go watch basketball or the opening ceremony. Right? So a little bit of background about myself. I was born on Long Island, New York, and I was born with a benign spinal tumor that went undiagnosed for the first 11 months of my life. Uh, during those first 11 months, the tumor became infected and inflamed and actually crushed my spinal cord, leaving me as an incomplete paraplegic. Um, just to show you guys, um, I was actually very fortunate that the my disability actually only affects my lower extremities, but I was left with very, very nice, sexy chicken legs like this. Um, Despite, um, despite my disability, my parents were very eager to give me a quote-unquote normal childhood. I went to a public school system. I had my able-bodied friends. Um, I didn't know anything about adaptive sports growing up. My parents loved to tell people that I got in trouble just as much as any other kid, probably more because I was trying to prove myself to my able-bodied friends. But the truth of the matter is, is I grew up inherently different than the other kids. You know? And to be honest, growing up with a disability was not easy. At that age, the last thing you could possibly want is to be different than all the other kids around you. And it's especially hard when you have a disability because your insecurities, your flaws, are constantly on display to the world around you. There's, there's no hiding them. There's no getting away from them. And to be honest, those disabilities tend to define us. You know, I remember I had these adolescent insecurities like, will my friends continue to accept me if I couldn't do things exactly the way they could, or will, you know, will I ever get my first kiss? Will a girl ever find me attractive? Which, by the way, Jennifer Jarvis, wherever she is in this world, <laughs> thank you, that kiss really did mean a lot to me. Um, in my junior year of high school, though, I was extremely fortunate enough to find a game that has given me the empowerment to change, uh, that has given me the empowerment to embrace what makes me different. And by embracing those differences, I was able to shatter any and all limits that anyone would ever try to place on me. I learned that by embracing those differences, I had to turn them into lessons to, to better myself. Like I said, outside of my disability, finding wheelchair basketball was the single most influential thing that has ever happened to me. And I'm not talking about the wins, the losses, the awards. You know, a lot of people look at the gold medal and they think, well, that's super cool, but ultimately you just won a basketball tournament, and that is 100% true. But for me, that gold medal is the culmination of a decade-long journey. I started playing wheelchair basketball for Team USA in 2006, actually when I was a student at the University of Illinois. Um, so my first Paralympic Games was in Beijing in 2008. That was the Olympic Games where Michael Phelps decided to go in and shatter every single individual record in swimming. Um, we actually did not share the same fate. Wheelchair basketball actually finished fourth. I really, really don't recommend working your butt off to be able to compete in an Olympic or Paralympic Games and finish fourth. You don't get anything except a nice little participation certificate and some cool clothing, which, I mean, it is cool, but it's not really why you go there, you know. A lot of the insecurities that I had growing up actually started to resurface. You know, am I good enough to really play at this level? Is this 
is something I really want to do for the rest of my life. This is something I'm truly passionate about. But because I learned those lessons early on about having to overcome those insecurities, I knew that I just had to use those hardships as a way to better myself. Fast forward four more years to London in 2012, uh, we actually won bronze, which is the one with the purple uh, strap right there. Again, it wasn't the ultimate goal, um, but it was an important step for me. At this point, I had graduated from the University of Illinois and with a degree in exercise science. I had moved to Germany to play professionally over there, which means that I was training year-round. All the hard work, all the sacrifices that I, me and my loved ones were making, it was just an important step for me to know that what I was doing was working. We were all progressing towards something, you know, something besides a participation letter. And then fast forward four more years to Rio, and I think at this point, you guys all know, I think I've said it enough that I won gold in Rio 2016. <laughs> that entire journey for me started at the University of Illinois at their adaptive sports program. You know, when you have a disability, our entire lives are different, right? We're basically trying to figure out how to navigate a world that was not built for us, which kind of forces us into our own little comfort zone, you know? Relating to adaptive, relating to college, you know, we don't get to experience everything that college has to offer. You know, college is about expanding and exploring your horizons while also creating this foundation of ideals by which you're going to live the rest of your life on, right? You, got, you have to figure out the balance between work and play, interaction, who your real friends are. But when you live with a disability, sometimes our insecurities kind of force us into our comfort zone. We don't get to experience everything. I would argue that adaptive sports, sport in general, is even more important for our generate, for our population, for those exact reasons, right? It forces us out of our comfort zone. And I will say that the, I think we, anyone can stand up here and talk about the benefits of sport and physical activity, but conversely, the negative aspects of inactivity um, actually infect us more greatly because we don't have the same athletic outlets as you guys do, right? You guys, if you want to be active, you can just go down to the local rec center, pop into a pickup game of basketball, get your friends together, play soccer, football, whatever it is. There's not a whole lot of pickup wheelchair basketball going on, right? So we don't have the same opportunities as you guys do to kind of fulfill that athletic outlet. Um, let's just go through some of the positives of physical activity, right? And we can look at it through the lens of having a disability. So I think that we can all agree that there's some physical aspects positive aspects of sport and activity. The main one being that it reduces the risk of major health problems, right? Reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, whatever it is. We as a population tend to live a more sedentary lifestyle because of not having as many outlets and because of those insecurities kind of forcing us all into um, our comfort zone. For me personally, I know that I live in pain every single day because I have to sit in this chair. And if I take two or three weeks off from my training, from lifting, from stretching, that pain is heightened greatly. So there's obviously some physical benefits. There's also some emotional and mental benefits. You know, when you grow up with a disability, it's really difficult to have a positive self-image because you're constantly reminded of what you can't do. Sport, at least for me, especially when I, was at, when I was at the University of Illinois, it allowed me to be an active participant in bettering myself, right? Sport can be a really empowering thing that you can't really get from any other aspect of life. You can put in your hard work, you can put in your sacrifice, and you can obviously see the direct changes in yourself both on the field of play and also in your other aspects of life. So that's really important. And then number three is, I think, the social benefit. Just interaction, just interacting with people. Again, when we're in our comfort zone, we tend to interact with people that have had similar life experiences to us. But that's not what growing is all about, right? Sport kind of forces you to interact with people that have had different life backgrounds, even though you're all working toward this common goal. And that's important to growth, not even on the field of play, but in your personal growth. And I think that, at least for me, life is better when inclusion is a top priority, right? People have new experiences. You learn about people that come from different backgrounds and that's how you ultimately grow. Looking back on my journey, I realized that my entire life has been about turning those insecurities and those losses into lessons to better myself. 
after each Paralympic loss, I vowed that I was going to come back a better player, a better person, a better teammate, and more importantly, uh, a better leader. And to be honest, that's true whether you're talking about wheelchair basketball or um, growing up with a disability or just facing any everyday challenges in life. I think every single person in this room today can relate to having some hardships that needed to be overcome. But it's what you do with those hardships that ultimately determine what type of person you'll become. Are you the type of person that will let those hardships and those insecurities define you and hold you down? Or are you the type of person that's going to adapt, uh, change, and in a weird way those insecurities tend to lift you up in the end? You know, there's no reason why we can't all strive to accomplish anything we want to in life. My favorite part, and this is the truth, my favorite part about having a disability is that I have the ability to change the world around me every single day. I have the ability to change the misconceptions about what can and should be possible. There are, there are no limits, except for the limits that we place on ourselves. You know, I see a world one day where everyone focuses on the positive aspects of each person. You know, we should be focusing on what he or she can do to help impact the world around them in a more positive light, and not feel sorry for or doubt someone's abilities just because I may have to do things a little bit differently than you. And that's true whether you're talking about disability, whether you're talking about gender, race, religious views, sexual orientation, no matter what it is, we should be focusing on the positive aspects of each person. The characteristics that are needed to succeed are within each of us. And this, with you guys coming here today, you guys are directly supporting the Husky Adaptive Sport Program, and you're directly empowering the next generation of adaptive sport athletes to accomplish dreams that they probably can't even conceive at this point. So for that, I just personally want to say thank you guys for coming, and thank you guys for your support. You know? Be your best self and continue to grow and the possibilities are endless for uh, each and every one of us. That's all I have, guys. <laughs> so, uh, at this point, what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to open it up to Q&A. And um, like I said, any and all questions are welcome. While you guys all think of your awesome, phenomenal questions, I'm going to be able to just pass these around. So this is the one from London. You guys can do what you want with it. Just don't take them, please. <laughs> and this is the gold from Rio. I'll start over here. <laughs> Who has the first? Well, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so have you ever had people or anyone really question um, or challenge your credibility as an athlete? And if so, how have you combated that? Wow, that is a awesome first question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. I mean, the fact of the matter is uh, it's very hard, especially in the U.S., to, for us to be looked at and considered as athletes, right? Um, despite the fact that our game has the same rules as able-bodied basketball, minus one big one, there's no double dribble in our sport. Um, but just the fact of to be looked at as an athlete that makes sacrifices, that you have to put in just as much work as any high-performance athlete, um, it's definitely hard to be taken seriously. Yeah. And one of the things that we're trying to work on is reducing the gap in payment from the Paralympics and the Olympic Games. Right now, any Olympian who wins a gold medal, they get 20,000 bucks. It's just a lot of money. We get five. So you can argue that we put in the same amount of work, and even the US Olympic Committee doesn't see the value in the Paralympic Games. So it's definitely a challenge. But um, I can tell you that the awareness about adaptive sports is getting better and better each year. The Paralympics have grown um, significantly over the last decade, so we're on we're on the right track, but it's definitely not where we want it to be just quite yet. Thank you. You are welcome. I have a question. Yeah. How did you begin playing adaptive sports? Like you mentioned that pickup basketball is an everywhere, so how did you begin? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. So. Um, so uh, athletics were always a big part of my life. I was, um, in, in, around middle school, I was that really inspirational disabled kid who uh, was the manager of every local, of every you know, high school sports team. 
you know, and would give speeches about like win this one for me because I can't go out there, or I was the manager of the football team that got to call like one play every single game, you know, and uh, it, it just wasn't enough for me. You know, I wasn't I wasn't born to sit on the sidelines, and I was actually the manager of the track team one year, keeping times like a very good manager does, and I saw um, a wheelchair racer compete. And he wasn't competing against everybody, against anybody, but he was just there, kind of trying to get his time down. And that was the first time I saw Adapter Sports, so I was like, oh my god. So I took that as information, and he hooked me up with this wheelchair manufacturer. And this wheelchair manufacturer actually said, listen, track is difficult. It's really expensive. You have to put in a lot of time and work. Have you ever thought about basketball? And I didn't know anything about wheelchair basketball, and there just so happened to be a, a, a junior team that played 10 minutes away from where I grew up, and I never knew about it. There was never any, you know, marketing or whatever for them, um, and I went down, and, you know, I was pretty good at it, and I never really left. So, yeah, it was um, kind of lucky, I guess, if you would say. Uh, what would you say was, like, your biggest motivator or, like, inspiration growing up, like, getting into adaptive sports? I am one of those people that hate to lose more than I like to win. So I, I really hate to admit that because a lot of my drive comes from a really negative place. Uh, but I would say at the beginning, what drove me was the fact that this was my place to feel like an equal. You know, wheelchair basketball was a way that I could go shoot with my friends and I'm a little bit competitive. So I would feel like if even though I'm shooting from a wheelchair, um, I can beat you, you know, like, he can play horse and I can beat you, sort of thing. Um, it was the first time that I felt like we were, everything was on an even playing field, so that drove me a lot in the beginning. Um, as I progressed toward more like high performance level, um, losing definitely drove me. The fact of uh, working so hard to be at a Paralympic Games and then finishing fourth, that was not the most fun feeling, um, but it did drive me. So. I hate to say it, it comes from a little bit of a negative place, but uh, it, it, I guess it works. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Did you go to Illinois knowing that they had um, an adaptive sports program? Yeah. Uh, so there's about, I don't know, 10 schools? 13, 13 schools right now uh, with adaptive sports programs. When I was coming out, I think there was only seven. Um, so the options, there weren't so many options. Um, it, number one, all the schools got me out of New York, which I love. It was actually the first time I saw a cow in real life, <laughs> uh, so that kind of freaked me out a little bit. Um, but I was very close with the coach there, and it was the best academic school that offered adaptive sports. Um, I was actually able to go there on a part athletic and part academic scholarship, so out-of-state tuition is pretty crazy. Um, so the fact that they could cover the costs were a big part of it. Um, and I just... You know, I love what the program was about. Their program wasn't just about like winning national championships or anything. It was about spreading the, spreading awareness for adaptive sports. It was about inclusion in society. In society. We would go around to all the local um, elementary schools and teach little kids about wheelchair basketball while also being a part of all of the collegiate events that they would do at the University of Illinois. So. Um, that was one of the first places that I actually felt like an athlete. Um, so I just love what they stood for, um, both kind of on and off the court. Good question. You guys are on fire right now. Yeah. Oh, you go first. You go first. <laughs> um, so I have two questions. That's why I said she Go for though. it. <laughs> so my first question is, if you were a fruit, what kind of fruit would you be? And my second question is, uh, I love that question. And my second question is, do you think you would have worked as hard and been able to be in the Olympics without your disability? I've literally never been asked that question. So the fruit one? The fruit one. So congrats. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> to be honest with you. I can answer the second question, though. There you go. Uh, no, absolutely not. I would not be an Olympic level athlete if I did not have a disability. Um, the best part about being a Paralympian, right, is that we just don't have as much competition as you guys do. You guys are competing against literally millions of people in one sport. We're competing against like hundreds. Um, 
And to be honest with you, I'm like five foot five, a buck thirty. Not really. Maybe I could be a curler or something. I don't, know, but I, I don't see myself as a basketball player, you know, able-bodied basketball player. Uh, so yeah. So no, I don't think I'd be a. Oh yeah, um, I was going to say, do you play for a team now? I do. I play for the New York Rolling Knicks, actually. There's, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 NBA teams that have um, an adaptive sports program. Uh, they don't really, they give us a budget, um, but they don't really do anything else besides that. We get to wear their jerseys. Um, we are actually pretty fortunate with the Knicks. They, they include us in some local events um, around the city, uh, but besides that, we don't, we're not really affiliated with them in any way. Um, but yeah, we play for the New York Rolling Knicks, me and that guy Ryan over there. So. Mm -hmm. Just a follow up to, to the, um, the Rolling Knicks. What can, what can we do, you know, whether it's ESPN, you know, all the, the, the TV programs, what can we do to help put you guys on TV? To help well, we have like 25 minutes left, and that is just not enough time to I answer know. that question. <laughs> uh, I would say this. So social media is an extremely powerful tool, right? Um, I would, what, what me and a few other guys are trying to do or is trying to increase our social media presence, right? A lot of us kind of want ESPN to come to us, and because we think that, you know, we're better than we actually really are. Uh, but if we can kind of build the following ourselves, um, and not necessarily ask ESPN to do that for us. Uh, I think that's a really interactive way to grow the sport. Um, once you have the followers, ESPN will come. And um, I mean, the Paralympics have gotten more exposure in the last decade. You know, they've gotten more and more. So um, NBC, ESPN, they've treated us fairly so far. Um, but it is still a business to them. So we, if we had to do a lot of the work, then that's kind of what we had to do. So. Follow me on social media, guys. <laughs> I know that through Lindsay, we were able to watch some of your games. Oh, you know Lindsay? I know Lindsay. Oh, cool. Um, I, I've actually been lucky enough to see see uh, and Ryan both play in, in, in real life. Um, it's very exciting. I've never seen a basketball, a wheelchair basketball game. Oh my God, it was amazing. Um, but it, you know, I've been lucky enough to see uh, through YouTube and whatnot. Just you know, send me a link, which is great because you know you can't always go to other, other places in the country. So it is great to see you guys, you know, play, um, and it would be nice if we could, could get that out more. Yeah, it's definitely something that we're working towards, and like I said, social media, I feel like, is the best tool for that right now. Um, millennials, I've learned, have a very small attention span, so like, Instagram videos for like, you know, 20 seconds, that's kind of in their wheelhouse, so we can, uh, we can do like some cool 20 second highlight videos and stuff, I think that that's a great way to kind of start. Uh, well, we actually play with a guy, um, he's actually from, from Canada, who is, uh, I think he's won three, the last two or three gold medals, um, Sydney, Athens, they lost in Beijing, and then they won again in London, so three of the last four. Um, his name is Patrick Anderson, he's pretty much the LeBron of our sport, you know, the combination of being big and fast all together all at once. Um, and uh, he has a really strong social media following also, so if you want to follow him, that would be okay too. <laughs> Very good question. Steve, would you be where you're at now as an athlete um, without having the experience at the University of Illinois or you know, at that collegiate level? Yeah, uh, absolutely not. Um, that experience at the University of Illinois, that was what propelled me to be the athlete I am today and the person I am today. Like I said, what drew me to that program wasn't just what they were doing on the court in terms of teaching me how to actually play, how to actually lift, how to actually train, um, but it taught me how to be a better leader and a better person in society, I guess. Uh, it gave me the foundation to build off of, and that's what I encourage you guys to try to promote here with the Husky Adaptive Sports. It's not just about wins or losses or anything. It's about increasing inclusion. It's about showing the student body that there are wonderful people with disabilities that have had 
really great experiences and different experiences in this life that um, hopefully that you guys can all learn from all together. Uh, so it, it's, it wasn't just about the encore stuff about, you know, hard work and working with the team and all that stuff. It's, it's about increasing the awareness and um, I definitely, yeah, I definitely would not be where I am today without, without those four years. I can see that one coming, right? <laughs> uh, I guess I have a question for you guys. So um, this is my, has any of you guys ever seen winter basketball? Thank you, Lizzie. You guys are awesome. Um, so this is um, this is my basketball wheelchair. Uh, just like you guys um, put on sneakers to play sports or cleats or whatever it is, um, we have a different wheelchair to play in. Um, so just think of the, this as our sneakers. Um, you guys can see that there's a variety of differences from this one to the one I'm playing in. I don't want to treat you guys you know, like your kindergartners or anything, but just to get some interaction. Um, can anyone tell me some differences? from this chair to the one I'm sitting in? The wheels are. The wheels are slanted. Uh, do you know why? Does it make it turn better? It does make it turn better. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so this one, um, the wheels are slanted, and obviously that helps with our mobility and our stability. Like I said, it makes it turn easier, and also it protects our hands. So if we're you know sitting next to each other, if the wheels were straight up and down, if you guys can imagine, that our hands would constantly hit each other. But with this one, there's some space, so that's for some safety. And obviously, this one has small wheels because I live in New York City and doorways are kind of narrow. Uh, so this one has to be able to fit in any, you know, through any room or whatever. Um, that one, that one doesn't. Any other um, differences that you guys see? I can turn it around. The, the bar? Yeah. Yeah, so that's just simply for safety reasons. Um, if you guys ever get the chance to watch wheelchair basketball, it's a pretty physical sport. There's a lot of contact. And um, most of us can't feel our legs. Some of us don't have legs. So uh, that kind of protects our lower body because we really wouldn't know if I like broke my foot or anything. Yeah. Um, there's two more major differences from this these chairs. This part hmm? oh, oh, for the seniors, I think it's really better. This part? No. What part? <laughs> oh, the side guards. Um, yeah, so these side guards are a little bit higher. Um, again, that kind of works for our stability. Um, just like you guys want your sneakers to fit, you know, tight and they're kind of configured to your feet after a little bit. The same thing with our wheelchairs, right? Each sports wheelchair is different than the other one. Um, and they're catered to our disability, our body type, our functionality. So. Um, yeah, that's they're pretty individualized to us. Yeah. This might be a dumb question, but I there went are to no um, dumb questions. No dumb questions. I went to Ryan's wheelchair basketball exhibition at the Basketball Hall of Fame, and like I noticed that a lot of the seats are at different heights. Is that just like based on the height of the player? Yeah, that goes back to certain body types and certain disability levels. So um, if you're a higher level disability, like if you're affected in uh, like your C spinal region. Mm -hmm. um, then you might have to sit a little bit lower for stability reasons. You might have to have like a lap strap just because you can't control your lower body. I'm a relatively um, low level disability in our sport, so I'm more of the able body kind. So if I were to sit in this one, um, I can do pretty much anything that you know an amputee can do, sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, they're they're very individualized to our body types. So. Um, the other two things that they have these wheels in the back. I know that you guys can't really see them, but obviously we don't want to tip over in our sports wheelchair. It happens from time to time. Um, but this one, obviously, it has no wheels in the back, and that you know, again, for adaptability reasons, we need to be able to jump up on curbs or go on the grass or whatever it is. Um, obviously, this one is just for the gym. And then the other thing are these cool snowboard straps. Um, just like I said. You want the chair to fit as tight to your body as humanly possible, and again, for stability reasons, you don't want to hit something and fly out of the wheelchair. Whereas this one, I can get up, I can transfer into the bed, the shower, whatever it will be. So, good job. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. I know you're from New York, so like, how was it playing in Germany? Uh, Germany is nothing like New York City. 
New York City is <laughs> super cool and super mean. Like people are a little bit mean. Uh, Germany, there's nothing cool about Germany, and everyone is really nice. Uh, it, 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 I will say that if any of you guys get the opportunity to live in a foreign country, um, I would take full advantage. I got the opportunity to go there right when I graduated from U of I. So literally, I walked on stage, got my diploma, and then the next week I was in Germany. Um, it was a chance for me at 22 years old to learn a new language, meet new people, experience new culture. Uh, you know, it broadened my horizons, and I met friends that I will have for the rest of my life. So um, it, again, it's one of those things that once you get out of your comfort zone, you don't really know how much you can how much you can grow. Um, and I encourage you guys to really get out of your comfort zones, like living in a foreign country, and uh, have one of those unbelievable, unbelievably valuable experiences. They also have professional leagues over there. So um, our league in the states is all recreational. Um, like I said, we maybe get a small budget from the NBA teams, but everybody, all the other players, you know, they have jobs, they have families. Um, overseas, it's considered a little bit more of a professional league. You get paid to play, you get, you know, an apartment stipend, you get an automobile stipend, food stipend, um, and then obviously there's like 1,500 to 2,000 people that come to every game, at least for the club team that I played for. Uh, so it's considered a, a professional league over there. So playing at U of R gave you the opportunity to play? Like, did you get recruited while playing? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, as you can imagine, our sport is um, a pretty small sport, considering. Um, and with my exposure to competing in Beijing and London, while also competing at U of I, um, I had some contacts over there originally. Um, they've seen, oh, the coaches kind of saw the level I was at, and then asked me to come over there right away. Uh, but, I mean, there are... Uh, a million other ways and paths to get over there. I mean, Ryan played professionally overseas as well in Spain. Um, so it's uh, if you kind of find the right fit and if the opportunity is there, uh, it's definitely a, a cool experience. I have a question. Um, you talked about being uncomfortable growing up and different things like that and how I guess sports have pushed you out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. What would you say to prospective athletes who maybe are timid or nervous or kind of don't want to come out um, and sort of give adaptive sports a try or see a wow. future in adaptive sports. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. Um, I would, am I, am I speaking directly to the kid with a disability? No, well, just our, I'm just curious for like our student population in general. Yeah, I would tell them that a lot of people have a certain expectation or a certain, or a certain stigma when they hear adaptive sports, right? When I first heard about wheelchair basketball, I literally thought like we were pushing around and shooting on like these like little Fisher Price hoops, you know what I mean? Like, I was like, there's no way that we can shoot at a regular basket because we're sitting down in a wheelchair. Right. Um, so I think number one is to show them how awesome sport can really be, right? You want to shatter that stigma of what people think of when they have when they see adaptive sports and then when they get involved I would just tell them to try as many sports out as humanly possible right like I am a basketball player but there's wheelchair track there's wheelchair tennis wheelchair softball there's actually a wheelchair football league that happens a little bit um, on the west coast so like there's tons of athletic outlets um, you just kind of have to find which one is suited more to you um, so I would tell them number one just come out don't even think about it. Just yeah. hop in a chair, do whatever it takes to just get out and try something. And then once you can kind of find your niche, um, there's so many opportunities. And then obviously they should use resources like you know Ryan and Kenisha to kind of point them in the right direction on where they want to go. But I would say the most important thing is to just shatter that stigma of adaptive sports and have them come out and try it. Awesome. Thank you. That was a good question. You're winning so far. <laughs> um, what was actually about your major? Because I'm actually the same major, so I was just wondering, like, what did you go to like, school initially for for that? I'm sorry about your Patriots, by the way. <laughs> yeah. 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 Honestly, yeah. they did really well. Yeah. <laughs> um, my major, I graduated with a degree in exercise science, so it's a kines 
major mm -hmm. uh, with a minor in gerontology. Um, so at the University of Illinois, the exercise science program actually um, has a more research-based focus. It's not a high performance-based focus. So um, my degree actually um, pushed us in the direction of working with special populations. So uh, anybody with you know osteoporosis, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, um, the elderly, most importantly. Um, so we could go into you know a gym-like setting and be certified to train those specific types of people. Not necessarily, you know, in a, a high performance sport or strength conditioning side. We didn't really do that side of it. We were more special populations and research based. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you said that you went to Germany like, to play over there. Um, what was one of the biggest lessons that you took away from there? Um, I would say just the fact of, well, I remember the plane ride over. So I made this decision without talking to my family and. Uh, mm -hmm. I come from a very Italian Catholic family, which is like, you don't make any family decisions without talking to the family. Uh, so I remember being really, really scared on the plane right there. Like it didn't really hit me until I was in the air and I was like, oh my God, I'm going to Germany. Um, but just once I landed and once I got that experience, um, the fact of how good it felt to get out of your comfort zone, get out of your little bubble, um, to get away from your friends who made you feel so comfortable, but just kind of take that first step towards um, having an experience that you don't really even have all the answers for. You just you just go, you just do it. And you don't apologize for making that decision. You know that that's what you want at that moment, that's what you want, and that's what's gonna make you happy, to just do it. And don't let anyone kind of hold you back and how rewarding that is once you kind of get there. You don't even have to have this measure of success when you make decisions like that. You just have to go do it. Figure, find yourself, figure it out when you get there. You don't even have to have a plan, and it was just so rewarding to meet new people, to experience a new culture and a new language. Um, that was the big, that was the biggest takeaway from it for me. Um, so I've been like fortunate to hear a lot of um, people's stories with like either disabilities or have injuries like throughout their sports career, mm -hmm. and one thing like not common uh, between all of them is like the definition of toughness. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe give like a definition of your, for yourself? Totally. Uh, I think, well, at least for me, right, my definition of toughness is how resilient are you, right? Everyone's going to face hardships in this life. Um, I know that for me personally, mine started out when I was pretty young, so I didn't really have any other choice. Um, but you're always going to get knocked down, right? The, classic Rocky story, but it really is not how many times you get back up, but who you are when you come back. Um, are you going to learn from it? Are you going to grow? Or are you just going to constantly make that same mistake over and over again? I know a lot of people, especially in the wheelchair basketball world, that get knocked down once or don't make one team or um, you know have one bad game and then they go back into their shell and they go back to their family and they play FIFA for hours and hours at a time. You know, that's that's not what toughness is. That's that's um, you have to be resilient. You have to be able to not be afraid to stick your neck out there and to get knocked down. I've been knocked down plenty of times, um, but each time I've had, I've been very fortunate to have some support of um, some great people, and they've always picked me back up, and I've always been a better player and a better person because of it. And like I told Ryan before, um, I, you know, I, I've lost more times than I've won. So if I gave up after Beijing, if I gave up after London, I would have never won that gold medal in Rio. So um, toughness for me is the resiliency of going through hardships um, and becoming a better person because of those hardships. Thank you. Steve, what's next for you? Uh, from from a professional from a basketball standpoint. Uh, well, um, I uh, was fortunate enough to make another USA team. We're going to Hamburg in the summer um, for the World Championships. Um, it's uh, it's something that we haven't as a country won since 2002. Uh, so even though we won in Rio, we haven't won a World Championships in a while too. So that's another motivating factor. Um, for me, though. 
uh, it's my life is really about balancing the high performance side of it versus um, the off the court stuff. You know, working with various nonprofits to spread disability awareness, doing things like this to talk to the people who are really going to interact with these with disabilities and really encourage them to get into adaptive sports. Um, just kind of finding that balance between not putting basketball as the number one, two, and three priority in my life, um, while also continuing to spread the sport. And then obviously I, I will, I haven't made the team yet because we have to try it every year, but I'm planning to go to Tokyo um, for, the last, for my last Paralympic Games. I love sushi. <laughs> Seems like a pretty fun place to go. We have like four more minutes, so anybody have any other last questions, remarks? I haven't heard from uh, two people with disability yet. So that means you guys just chilling? <laughs> All right. Okay, cool. Um, I guess I have a question for you guys. Um, I didn't go around the room and take, you know, like, what's your guys' major? What's your affiliation with sport and, uh, and class? Can we just, what's your, can we just go around the room real quick? Yeah. yeah. It was like, major. Sure. <laughs> That's great. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> major, how about okay. that? Wait, can I ask a question real quick? Of course you can. Do you like to dance? Do you dance? I, well, <laughs> uh, yeah, I like to dance. <laughs> That's kind of basic, like dancing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's like electro stuff that is kind of pop, like like DJ Marshmallow or whatever. Like, that's not really me, but it would be like we can we get down. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. But my name is Mia. Um, I'm a molecular and so I'm. Oh my God, that's an amazing place to start. <laughs> my name is Kim, and I'm an elementary education teacher. Okay. Okay. I'm a bachelor's science. Nice. I'm a psychology. My name is Danielle and I'm studying speech therapy and sign language. Oh, wow. My name is Lissa and I'm studying the exact same thing. Oh. I'm Taryn. I take sign language because that's cool, but I'm also I'm just a biology major. Yeah. I'm Alex, I'm a sport management and marketing major. I'm Mia of Undecided. I'm Cheryl, I'm Flatland. I'm Anders, I'm a speech language and hearing science engineer. I'm Mitchell, I'm a biomedical engineer. I'm a Danish sport manager. I'm Tanisha. I'm a sport manager. Um, so I just, I just wanted to just highlight that you guys all have different backgrounds, right? You guys all come from a different place, especially from an academic side of things. Um, and the fact that you guys are, have this interest of, you know, working with the adaptive sports program, you don't have to have a sport background to work with kids with disabilities, right? Um, I would just encourage you guys, like I like I said before, to just kind of find people with disabilities and have them try out as many sports as humanly possible. And you don't even have to think about it from a high performance side. Just look, just think of it as you're basically taking someone and tearing them out of their comfort zone, and you could really have a positive impact in someone's life. It could be as simple as bringing them to the gym and shooting hoops with them could be something as simple as um, just kind of bringing them into the weight room and lifting with them or whatever it is, you know what I mean? Um, that small um, act can really benefit someone's someone's life in a great way. So um, even though you guys all come from a different background, I just want to thank you guys for um, all having that you know, <coughs> one passion about uh, adaptive sports. So. Bio major. <laughs> that is intimidating. Uh, any other questions? Oh wait, I'm supposed to say if you guys have any, uh, if you guys have need any other information about Husky Adaptive Sport um, or want to get involved, if you don't know Kanisha, this is Kanisha. This is the person to talk to. Um, can I just say what? Oh, you have. I was going to say who stole the bronze, but uh, what you did. <laughs> Well, we'd like to thank you all for coming out. We'd also like to thank UConn for the activities for helping us bring Steve here. Everyone have a great night. Oh, if you want to come up, Steve is very friendly. He'll speak to you. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>